Jessica Harrington has been a jumping legend, but now she's tasting success at the highest level on the flat. A star in the making, Alpha Centauri wins the coronation stakes. And it's going to be an Irish win for the Jessie Harrington team and Albina in the hands of Shane Foley. Alpine star Frankie de Tori for Jessica Harrington goes on to an impressive win in the coronation stakes. It's hard to describe the depth of her achievements, but how would you describe Jessie Harrington? Probably mad, it's probably the first one. It's very unpredictable. Oh, she's a great woman, great worker, great attitude. She's always organised, she always knows what she's doing. An incredible work ethic. Hard working. Strong. Determined. Good person to work with. She does a great job, like. Genuine. Unbelievable amount of energy. Respectful. You can call a spade a spade, and I always say that I always will with her. Brilliant. A legend. Uh, describe yourself, a few words. <laughs> oh God, that's difficult. Uh, what am I? Um, probably hardworking, a uh, bit stubborn, uh, never hold a grudge, and enjoy life. Tucked away in Kildare, a stone's throw from the Wicklow border, the sleepy village of Moon has risen to stardom due to a succession of star residents. Sizing John, Jetski, Moscow Flyer and Alpha Centauri have brought international fame to a place quite literally bypassed by the rest of the world. But its most famous resident of them all has come a very long way. Uh, just going back, way back to the start, obviously when you grew up, you must have been surrounded by animals. You were homeschooled till you were 12 and then you went off to uh, boarding school in Gloucestershire. Not that far from Cheltenham, I suppose. But did you spend more time around animals almost? Oh, you did. I always rode. No, I don't even ever think, I don't, I don't remember learning how to ride. I remember there's always been animals, there was cows, there was pigs, there was everything. Or, you know, you just grew up and hens. You just took it for granted that animals were around. Um, and me, I, my brother, who was a year older than me, you know, we got up to a fair amount of divilment with our ponies and one thing <laughs> and another. Uh, but we had a great, you know, it was brilliant. We were given a lot of freedom and we used to go off riding everywhere we wanted to. And, and it was great fun. And was that was it always the plan? Even as a child, like, can you remember wanting to do anything other than working with horses, or was it always just it has um, to be with horses? Not really. No, I never. Uh, I was my father would not have allowed me to work just with horses. Yeah. I was sent off to England and work in London and did various things, and and then actually I got married quite yet very very young at twenty one uh, to a farmer in England, mm. and um, so I was over there for seven years. Um, and it didn't work out completely, so it didn't. So I came back and and then married Johnny, who was here, and he had horses. But I'd really, you know, I came back to be, you know, be part of his life. And he was a bloodstock agent, and so he went to sales, and so I tagged along going to sales. And he, he was doing a lot of business in those days out in Australia, and I went, I think, three years in a row out with him to Australia um, because he was selling horses out there and and had some clients out there. They call him assistant, they call him head groom. <laughs> right, what job title do you prefer to be known by, Eamon? Ah, uh, sure, I'm just sort of head man here now and that's it, you know. And you've been here a while? Well, I've been a long time here, yeah, yeah. How long? Since the beginning, since Mr. Harrington bought it back in the 80s or whenever he bought it back in the 80s. So do you predate, predate everybody here now? Yes, including Mrs. Harrington. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say she'd love to hear that. <laughs> no, well, it's true. And did but you ever think it was going to end up the way it has? No, but um, I tell you, he was always a great man to buy a horse and he kept, he could always foresee things happening. Like, you know, he's a great bloodstock agent and everything like that, you know. And the place was developing all the time, like from a couple of horses to what he had. He used to buy, initially he used to buy young stock and resell them and how he got into training was maybe if something didn't pass a vet or something like that it wasn't getting enough money for it we'd break it and send it out uh, send it in or put it into training here and he had a bit of luck that way and just we got a few nice horses then and the thing snowballed and yeah and then training taking over the full license in 1989 but you'd already taken over the johnny's permit earlier on around 83 84 you had the Lincolnshire success in the mid 80s. How did that all come about? And was it, did you segue into it or was it a very definite decision? Right, I'm going to do this now. We always traded horses 
um, and bought young horses to uh, sell on at the Land, uh, Land River sale or the, the uh, Derby sale. And one year, I don't know, the three horses we had to sell all went wrong. They had mm. bits and pieces wrong with them and they didn't pass the vet, so they were there. And Johnny said, oh, I think we're going to have to, to um, train these horses. Uh, I think you better take out a public license and we'll see if we can get owners for them. And, and that's, how, that's how it started. But then in terms of the early days, tell me about them. I mean, what was the reaction when you said, OK, I'm going to train and I'm going to be a horse race trainer? And were those very daunting days? Mm, not really. It didn't, didn't daunt me. Um, basically, there weren't that many women training mm. at that stage. Um, and I think most people, I was lucky you know, enough to get winners the first couple of years when I was training. I didn't have that many horses. Uh, but at the sort of Christmas and Easter and maybe at Punchstown, even if I only had four winners in a year, they were at big meetings and people noticed me. And I think, you know, some people sort of looked at me, other trainers, and thought, well, she won't be around for long. She's got a husband. She's got, uh, then at that stage, had three children, young children, and had to deal with them as well. Um, and so, you know, and I just had Kate. When I got my license in 89, um, I, Kate was three months old. So they really looked at me and thought, well, she, she can't do this. She can't do all of these things. But anyway, I survived. And looking back at what you achieved early on, it was groundbreaking, as everybody else can see now. Were you aware of that at the time? No, absolutely, totally not aware. They just went out, did things, you know, and, and that was it. You know, I just was lucky enough to have the horses and, and, and win races. People, you know, would love to say, oh, you're a woman trainer, female trainer do done this, you've done that. I said, well, I'm a trainer. You know, it's the same as Rachel Backmore has the same problem. She's referred to sometimes as a female jockey. And if, she, if you ask her, she says, I'm a jockey. Yeah. You know, the fact that I'm female or male, it actually, is then I feel the same. You know, you're, you're, you're play, it's, you're, it's a totally level playing field. We have no allowances because we're female. Um, the horses do, but we don't. Uh, but so I always just think, no, it's just, it's the way it is. The growth of facilities at Commonstown has been remarkable in recent years. A new sand carpet fibre gallop was completed three years ago when more than 30 boxes were added earlier this year. 200 horses, 60 plus staff, and three determined Harrington ladies. This has very much become a family operation. Emma and Kate, how would you describe what's starting off with Emma in a few words? Uh, She's very, very efficient, very strong-minded, and runs the office beautifully. She does all the nasty jobs like hiring and firing and all of that, and she's brilliant at it. And then Kate? Kate, Kate is very, she, she does, again, she's very hardworking. Um, she uh, does all the lists, all the work lists, um, sorts out all of that, and is very, very good at it. She's just been a great inspiration for um, all of us to know what work is and um, you get out what you put in. And are you more like her? Um, I think I'm probably uh, a little bit more practical at times. Um, so I'd have a more methodical way of looking at things, whereas mum would just kind of decide on something and I, I'd always think, what the heck is she doing that for? And it normally works out perfectly and she's running her horse in a race that we didn't think was a great idea and sure enough it comes out and wins. But I think that's her, she, her training is very much her feel and um, she never, I suppose, would, she's always up for a challenge and will, if she thinks the horse is good enough, she will, she'll quite happily go for the challenge and see what happens. We be a bit like each other but um, she, does, she trains a lot of a lot of her training is done on instinct mm. and gut feeling how the horse looks that morning and what she's feeling she's taught me to look at the horse let the horse tell you how they are and really really lit. we're very fortunate here we have a lot of very very good exercise riders and jockeys working for us so um, always go with them another quick question actually about Kate and Emma which one of them is most like their mother um, Emma. Emma. No, Kate's very like her father. Really? Mm. Very, very like her father. And so in terms of the way that you want things done, but that kind of works quite well, doesn't it? Because, I mean, you and Johnny really complemented each other very well. Yeah, a good few fights. Like every, every, every good successful marriage or relationship in a family, you've got to, you've got to have opinions. But for every great trainer, 
there's always a few star horses who just kick things up to the next level at certain points. Starting off with Oh So Grumpy at Galway mm-hmm. and then working on to the amazing Moscow Flyer. These must have been godsends for you when they come along. You know, you don't nev- you, you never know when they're coming on because mm. the, the, the little small thing that comes into the yard, you know, when if it's a jumper at the age of three or of a, a yearling uh, on the flat, you don't know what's going to be the star when you come in. You know, it's not usually the most expensive horse you have in the yard. It's usually somewhere running around there, there's, there's one that is a star. So tell me about Moscow Flyer, right? an incredible horse and an incredible story behind him in terms of he didn't win a bumper. He uh, ended up being one of the best horses in his discipline. But even the owner, he didn't really want a horse initially, was bought for him. Yeah, well, Brian, uh, the reason we ever bought Moscow Flyer was that um, Brian Carney's son, Connor, was a friend of my son's. Mm. And, and Connor thought it'd be a good idea because he loved racing. And uh, if his father, when he retired, uh, didn't just have golf to do, he ought to go racing as well. So anyway, he persuaded his father to buy a horse and the horse that I managed to buy for him was Moscow Flyer. He'd never owned a racehorse before. And as he said, he went on the most amazing journey mm. with Moscow as, as I did and as Barry Geraghty did. He must have given you some of your best days. Ah, some brilliant days, absolutely. Because he went, you know, he was so, the, the, the longevity of his career was mm. the, be- the best thing, you know, and, and uh, you know, I said the other day when Barry um, retired, I wasn't sure whether Moscow Flyer uh, made me or made Barry, Barry or Barry mm. made me or Moscow Flyer did. <laughs> um, you know, it was a little toss up of the dice. Um, but he was an amazing horse. Talking about amazing days, I mean, Jetski's champion hurdle in 2014, that must have been the most emotional of all victories in many ways. It was fantastic, you know, it really was. Um, Johnny was ill and I'd gone over, Kate had stayed here to look after him and that was just amazing. And Barry, Barry carried him over the line, I think. <laughs> and beating your good friend as well into second yeah. with my tent of yours, Nicky Henderson. Yeah, Nicky Henderson, yeah, and we were all saying, and as Nicky said that night, he said, if I was gonna get beaten, I was glad it was you who beat me. <laughs> <laughs> Very generously. I was basically, a, a, and everyone considered me, a, a national hunt trainer. Mm. And then I was lucky enough to get all these nice flat horses. And so I suppose now my, I'm, I suppose now I'm actually two thirds flat, one third jumping. Shortly after Oso Grumpy and Moscow Flyer came Max Joy and Boston's Angel, who ironically outbattled Gordon Elliott's Jesse's Dream to land the RSA. But the real Jesse's dreams grew and grew. First, a champion hurdle, and then the completion of a glorious big three with the Cheltenham Gold Cup. And then Sizing John, I mean, that was an extraordinary story. He'd, he was such a good two-mile horse. He'd won over, um, over hurdles a grade one. He'd won a grade two over fences. If it wasn't for Duvan, he probably would have won another maybe two or three grade ones over two miles. Yeah. Um, Without Duvan, if Duvan hadn't been there, could he have stayed at two miles as a result of winning three? Would it, it have been harder to step him up? I, I have no idea because uh, when, when, he was win- when he was mainly, except for the last time he was finished behind Duvan, he was tra- mm. Henry trained him. Mm. And I only got him by, by really by default. Henry had done all the hard work with him and Super Sunday. And, and what all had happened when I did it, had him was that the first time Robert rode him, he said, this is not a two-miler when we mm. finished second yet again to Duvan at Christmas. He said, step him up in trip. But he did, you know, he, he had an amazing year. And he will come back. He's sound now and he's, he seems to be in great form and he'll, he's going to run, I think, in the stall. Very good. I'm looking forward to that. And mm. apparently I had heard he's, he's quite a character. Oh, he's a great character. He is himself. He's a great big horse and he's a real gentle giant, but he is a character. While well, national hunt racing is in her blood, she has had some very useful ones on the flat. In recent years, this has grown to more than a secondary interest. Well over half of her string are unlikely to ever jump a fence. I always had a few flat race horses, and yeah. they just always, uh, you know, people say, oh, when did you start training on the flat? I said, I've always started training. Mm. I've always run, uh, been, had flat horses. Would you describe it in terms of the breakdown now? Obviously, you know, you're flying on the flat at the moment. As somebody said to me recently, she's a rising star of international flat racing. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you get a great kick out of that. Uh, exactly. But no, it was, it, no, it's funny, it was, you know, I was basically, a, a, and everyone considered me 
a, a national hunt trainer. Mm. And then I was lucky enough to get all these nice flat horses. And so I suppose now my it, I'm I suppose now I'm actually two thirds flat, one third jumping. How do you end up getting people like the Nearchus family and owners like that? Is it a case that they come to you once you win these big races? Uh, no, that was really, they sold Path Fork. Mm. And then when I won a group one with him, they decided that, that year to send me some, uh, they sent me a couple of yearlings and that was how it started. And it's just very exciting and you go and see them in the autumn and then you, mm. you never know what you're going to get and then you get sent a list of what, you, what you're getting and, and it's just, it is very exciting because all their pedigrees go back so well, you know, and, you know, when we had Al Alpha Centuri, uh, that mare in a way had been a big, dis had been a disappointment. Yes. And up comes Alpha Centuri by Master Craftsman and she'd been to Galileo about four times. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the, the next thing is they have Alpine Star, who is by um, See the Moon. Uh, you know, and that, mind you, they look completely different. Uh, Alf Centuri was a great big filly, very, very big, and, and of course grey, so she looked amazing. Um, and Alpine Star, Star is actually quite a small filly and rather a bad sort of chestnutty colour. But she's, both of them had big, have, have big hearts. And of course, coronation stakes as well. Yeah, <laughs> both, both two full uh, two sisters winning coronation stakes. You know, two not not one year after the other, the year in between. I don't I don't know when it had actually been done before. And since Alpha Centauri went on to the Jacques Lenoir, uh, could you bag another one? Well, that's where, that's the plan. That's the plan at the moment. That's where she's going next. So, you know, she was unlucky just to get shinned in the Pre Diane, mm. the Chanty. Um, but look. That's where she's going to go next. And Albinia going to France, Marcel Boussac last year. She wasn't meant to go initially, was she? No, she wasn't meant to go. She, she ran in the Moy Glare and actually ran badly. And um, so uh, we'd actually, we weren't sure where we were going to go with her after that. And we were meant to be going with Alpine Star mm. because we knew she needed a little bit of a dig in the ground. Um, and so she was penciled in for the pre Marshal Boussac. Albania had been entered as well, um, two weeks, three weeks, two weeks before the uh, the, the Marcel Boussac, Alpine Star pulled the muscle behind, so she couldn't go. So I said, "All right, Albania can go," and um, you know she won. It was, it was great. Mm. And then and and she actually went on soft ground. We were a bit worried that day that she mightn't go on it, but she did. I know. We just last year we just seemed to have some very very good fillies. Um, you know, all, all of them together, and, and, and they've all, except the only one, funny enough, the, be the best hasn't won this year, but she's only run the once, which is Albina. Mm. Um, unfortunately, she, what happened to her was she, she went then to the Breeders' Cup and ran very well out there, and we hadn't realised probably she jarred herself up a bit out there, and then when we ran her in the Irish 1000 Guineas, the ground was very quick that day at the Curra, and she just didn't go on it, and so we've been paying the price since, so we're just, she's back now in great form. Mm. And we're waiting to go to the Snow Fairy Stakes at the, I think it's the 24th of August in, um, in the Curra. And then we'll have an autumn campaign with her. Now how did the link up with uh, Jesse come about? I think I had my first ride for Jesse in Galway as a seven pound claimer and he happened to win yeah. and I've just had a lot of luck for her down through the years as an apprentice and she's a great woman to ride for and a great woman to work for and luckily enough to get offered a job last year and we've, uh, we've flourished since then thank God. Albania and uh, Alpine Star, I mean they've taken to you to extraordinary places haven't they? Yeah look they're very very good fillies and to have them all in the one year is quite amazing, you know yeah. what I mean? Especially this COVID is can be frustrating watching them on the telly in, in France and England and that, but uh, no, they're two fantastic fillies. You've seen Alpine there this morning coming up the mm. gallop. Uh, she's not over big, but massive stride to her. I'll big new. We haven't seen the best of her yet this year, even if she has a bad one run, but uh, we'll, we'll get her back for later on when the, when the ground is slow. You'll see the real Albigny. new. And she won on Arc Day last year. That must have been some experience. Yeah, unbelievable. Obviously, with enabling that... Uh, it was massive over there, big crowd, but uh, to win over there on Arc Day was amazing. You must have a soft spot for her. She took you to the Breeders' Cup as well. She did, and was a bit unlucky in, in the Breeders' Cup, being honest. She, she fluffed the turn and got a bit far back, but uh, no, she is a good filly, and 
she could go back there again this year, bearing in mind it, it, see what it is, but um, no, she's a, she's a good filly. Finally, ambitions for the future. You're not stopping any time now, I presume. No, no, we're not going to stop. Oh, listen, there's loads of races that I want to win and places I'd like to go. You know, you know, I'd like eventually maybe to have runners in Australia. You know, I'd love to have something good enough to go to Japan and Hong Kong, uh, as well as, you know, I'd like to win a Breeders' Cup somewhere along the line. So Melbourne Cup, Breeders' Cup. I know, all of those sort of races. Would you put your feet up then? Oh, God, no. Why would I put, I'd get <laughs> bored and drive everyone mad. No, but like, you know, having the family behind me is, makes a big, very big difference here. And I don't have to, you know, I don't have to be everywhere. Finally, what's your secret if you had to sum it all up, the secret of your success? I don't think it's any secret. Hard work. <laughs> keep your head down, keep going and deal with the disappointments. Because in, this, in, in, in training racehorses or anything to do with animals, there are definitely more disappointments than there are elation. As the world waits for her to slow down, Jessie Harrington kicks on again and again. It's hard to imagine her being idle here while someone else takes the reins. With so many bright stars of moon on the horizon, the Queen of Commonstown looks unlikely to abdicate any time soon. But then again, as a rising star of international flat racing, why would she?